That's what the Word of God does. It warms your heart. So good to be here tonight. Uh, God laid this upon my heart today, and I jotted a few things down, some things I want to share. Uh, some time ago, uh, Brother David preached a message on the old paths. And so if you want to turn the Word of God for a, a starting scripture, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. If you want to turn there, put two. Tonight, I've entitled the message from this same passage of Scripture. I'm called it the good old days. Okay? Now, we older people will know what the good old days are. All right? So, I think everyone in this room tonight will look back and say that some of the times in our good old days, were a lot better than they are today. Okay, and that's not a negative thing. That's a positive thing. Because you see, because the world changes and changes fast does not mean that we are to change with the world. Okay, we are in the world, but not of the world. And so that's what I want to bring you about the, the good old days. And there's a there's a little thing here I want to I wanna read you somebody wrote. I do not know who wrote this little piece, but I want to share some things from this with you tonight as well as some scriptures. I think, it's, I think you'll find it, at least most of it, uh, a little bit hilarious. Uh, it says, I wish the old paths were before us instead of behind us. All right? Here's some of the reasons. I like the old paths when moms were home and dads were at work. When brothers went to the army and sisters got married before having children. When crime did not pay, hard work did, and the people knew the difference. I like the days when moms would, could cook and dads would work, and the children would behave. That's, a, that's pretty good old days, amen? If you can go back to that. When husbands were loving, wives were supportive, and children were polite. I love the days when women wore the jewelry and men wore the pants. I like the days when women looked like ladies, men looked like gentlemen, and children looked decent. I like the days when people loved the truth and they hated a lie. I like the days when they came to church to get in, not to get out. I like the days when hymns sounded godly, sermons sounded helpful, rejoice, uh, rejoicing sounded normal, and crying sounded sincere. I like the days when cursing was wicked and drugs were for illness. When the flags were honored, America was beautiful, and God was welcome. I like the days when we read the Bible in public, prayed in the schools, and preached from house to house. I love the days uh, of that. Uh, to be called an American was worth dying for. To be called an American was worth living for. And to be called a traitor was a shame. I like the good old days. Amen. And with that thought in mind, I want to read uh, the old paths verse in verse 16 of Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Way back then, God warned us in the scripture about the good days. The, he says the, the, the good way. Let me ask you a a common sense question. If you're walking in the good way, 
why would you need a new way? You don't need a new way. The old way works. And God says to ask for it. Now here's the conflict. And that's why tonight I want to give you some scriptures about the importance of being separated from the world. That's not preached a lot, but you know, we are in this world, but we are not of the world. We are to be different. God says that we, as believers, are to be different. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls us peculiar people. Different. When the world sees us, they've got to see something different. But when Christians blend with the world and, let, and go to the world's ways, then Christianity, the view of a Christianity, fades away. So that's the problem that we've got. And we all understand, uh, partially, it's mind-blowing, the technology that's in our world today. And the Bible said in the last days, knowledge will increase over and over and multiply, increase itself. And right now, it's astounding, the knowledge that's in the world. But there's something else that's astounding that's in the world. Although there's a lot of technology and mind-blowing things in our technology, there's so much stupidity in our world. So much. Things that makes absolutely zero sense. All right? And what's people doing? People are following the world. Now, we all, everybody being in the world, and there was times in our life when we were unsaved just like the world. We were not, we were blinded to the truth. We were lost without God. We had no understanding till he knocked on our heart's door and we opened it up and he came in and we met the Savior. That changes everything. That changes totally everything, not only here in life, but in eternity. Because now we are to walk in these new ways. We are to walk in the spirit, not after the flesh. We are to be separated from the world. Now, I, I know this is something that a lot of church people do not like to hear sermons on being separated from the world. Because you know what? I'll just be honest with you. The, the world has got so churchy and the churches have got so worldly, you can't hardly tell the difference anymore. Too much of the world is in the church. And guess what? People want to follow. They want to follow the flesh. They want to follow the world. And when you do that, you're walking away from God. Remember that. You and God face to face. And the closer you get to the world, the farther in every point of the world you get closer loving the things of the world, you go away from, away from God. And the closer to God you get, the farther away from the world you're going to go. So it's imperative for us to be separated from the world. So I, I, uh, I think the, the problem with Christianity today, when we look at the, the, at the good old days, there were days uh, in, in my lifetime when people went to church, where kids had manners, where parents... Uh, taught their kids right, but generation after generation after generation after generation has gotten progressively worse because several generations, I don't, do, do not know how many, but probably way back, you can remember the, the 50s, some of you, and the 60s, and I've noticed when we got to the 70s, boy, things really started turning worldly in the 70s. And when we got to the 80s, Man, it was rocking heavy with, uh, with immorality and all of that. And up into the 90s and then the turn of 2000, you can't even recognize where we are today in 2021. And all these generations, as you look at the condition of our world, the world is, uh, is there because in the condition they are because 
of, of, of who they were and how they were in each generation. And so somewhere along the line, before there was ever teenage rebellion, I remember that time as a parent, and maybe some of you do too, when teenagers rebel. Well, you know, back in, uh, back in our day when we, we were there, we rebelled too. Our, we were just slicker and not letting our parents know how rebellious we were. And by the way, the parents were pretty slick too in, in trying to uh, put an image of, uh, of how, how on top they were. I heard someone tell, tell uh, the, the story. Uh, this has been a long time ago how the teenager asked how the mom and dad met. He said, well, yes, yes, mom was going up one side of the mountain. I was going up the other side of the mountain. So we got up here to the top, and we just uh, bypassed each other, went down the other side. Oh, huh. <laughs> right? Oh, huh. Not so. But here's, when, when the parents way back dropped the prayer that be was at the table, the prayer, the prayer and the teaching of the kids and teaching their kids manners, I want to tell you something. Uh, there's hardly no manners left anymore. No, no manners. No manners at all left. Just rudeness in, in our society today. But... Uh, Parents dropped the ball in teaching their kids. And then they began to get uh, uh, a little bit more lenient with their kids. And then the kids, they always, the kids are going to be more progressive than the parents in every generation. And so when the parents let down the guard, then the children step up. And then when they get, when they get up and have kids, I'm not going to let uh, rob my kids the way my mom and dad did me and they become more liberal with their children. And guess what? They, they, their, their spirituality goes down the tubes. Then all of a sudden, you know, uh, they grow up and have children. And then they get worse. You know, the first thing you know, there's generations not even going to church. They don't know anything about God. And the only thing they're educated by is the schools, what they teach, or the television sets. And you know how that, how that went over generation after generation after generation, so you can see why we are the way we are. And it's because people down through the years never learned the principle to be separated, Christians separated from the world in the right kind of a way. So with that thought in mind, I just uh, feel impressed tonight to share some things, uh, some scriptures about being separated from the world. Uh, let's go to the book of, of uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. And I want us to look at verses 14 through 17. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 14. Here it starts. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers... For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, because of this, because God is in you and you in God, and God's going to walk with you and you're his people, you're his children, you've come out. And the Bible said, wherefore, because of these things, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. Boy, you don't hear many sermons on that. Touch not the unclean things, because when you become 
out of the world and you come into the Christian world, here's the great conflict, that old man and that new man. And and if Christians are not taught in the word of God about the dual nature that lies within and how that we are to be submissive to God and to follow that new man and to crucify that old man every day, if they learn that, Because when you look at what the world infiltrates to us, it's pathetic. And that's the world that we all learn from, that we dealt with, that we experienced by seeing and with the temptation. And and you've got preachers preaching the truth and, and Sunday school teachers teaching you the word of God and what's right and what's wrong. And you got the spirit of God within and all of a sudden... You have to see all of this stuff of the world. Well, everything's okay. There are no wrongs. There are no black and whites. You know, everything is okay. No, it's not. Because that's what the world does. And how many times we, by nature, are carnal like the world because we're in the world, we grew up in the world, We're philosophized by the world. Uh, We're tempted by all of the trinkets and the toys and the generations and the fads and all of that stuff by the world. And then we got the peer pressure of trying to reach the other world and we're so different, they don't want to be like us. And we see they're so different, we don't want to be like them. But the danger is when we don't see the difference and the danger in being like the world, You've made a big mistake, a big mistake, because your Christian life can't be what God would have it to be. Happiness and peace and all the joys of Christianity will evade you. They will completely go away. And so, wherefore, because God is in you and your body's the temple of God, yeah, what, uh, what, Fellowship or agreement hath the temple of God with idols. And our bodies are the temple of the living God. And I will dwell with them, God said, and I will walk with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. So God doesn't want his people walking in the course of the world. Number one, okay? All right, I think uh, let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Boy, this describes where we are today. From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and destroy, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. All right? That has to do a lot with our prayers. What's the prayer of most people? Asking God to give them the things they want. And most of the time they don't distinguish between a want or a need. Okay? You may want an ice cream sundae, but you don't need it. You may want that extra donut. And by the way, you probably should have the first one. Amen? You may want that donut. And the old body will say, yeah, I want that. And how many times does a body win? Most of the time, the hunger in there or the craving, especially when our eyes see it and our tongues begin to water and we can taste it. Have you ever been tempted that way? You just could not resist that chocolate bar or whatever it may be. And see, our bodies work against us. Because our bodies are the temple of God. Remember this. 
Everything we put in our bodies, you're putting it in the temple of God. Maybe that might help stop some of the cravings and some of the abuse of the things that we eat that we shouldn't eat. Okay? And that, that's just, a, that's just a, a tip of common sense right there. But we war. There's a war going on. There's a fighting. There's loss going on. And desires within us to have these things. And sometimes we cannot attain. And by the way, uh, once you do uh, uh, lust for things and you partake of those things, let me ask you a question. Is humanity ever satisfied when you get what you want? When you get what you desired and craved, guess what? You want more. And when you get more, you want more. And then it, it's never satisfied. And so if we realize that, we can, we can cut through some stuff and help ourselves, okay? We can help ourselves an awful lot. So that battle is always going on. And people ask God for things. You know what? Uh, they, the, the people uh, uh, prayed to God and asked God for things, and God granted their, granted their requests. But one of the saddest things in the Bible is when the children of Israel prayed and asked God for things, he said, he granted their request, but he sent leanness unto their soul. Sometimes the worst punishment God can give is to give us our prayer requests and the things we pray for. You ask amiss, and sometimes God is good enough to see that that's not good or right for you, and God will intervene sometimes and keep that from, from happening. But we think we know what we want. We think we know what's best. We think we know what the the will of God is, because it's our will. Well, listen, most of the time, if it's your will, it's most likely not God's will, because you have to be in the spiritual mode, searching for what God would have you. Everything in your life should be, if the Lord will. I'll go here or there, Lord willing. Don't make your brags. If God is willing, because we are to walk in the will of God, in the perfect, direct will of God. And guess how much forces of the world are flowing in to try to change what we are. Then verse 4 said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is the enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world, get this, is an enemy of God. Well, that should, where is that verse ever preached? Friendship with the world is an enmity with God. God made this world, he made all the evil in it, he made all the good in it so that mankind could have choices so we wouldn't be puppets. We all have a choice about this thing. But God knew and put the plan what was best for us. He gave us the provisions and he gave us the mind. He gave us the opportunity that we could make the choices, the right choices, and choose him over the world. And you know, for a long time back in Ecclesiastes, I read that, and I think the first time I ever heard this uh, uh, a long time ago, uh, David preached it, and it came from Ecclesiastes. And there's a statement in there that said, and I've read it many, many times, that God hath set the world in their heart. And I thought, Wait, he said, be separated from the world. He said, if I'm a friend of the world, I'm an enemy of God. Yet God set the world in our hearts. 
Why? Because we're in the world. That's all we know with our mind and our heart and our emotions and all, all, all of our being. That's, that's how we learned. Everything we learned, we learned in the world. We learned most of it from the world. We didn't know nothing until we got saved. Until we had a brand new, a, a brand new book to follow. But God set the world in my heart. And I thought, why would God set the world in my heart uh, if he tells us not to even, who does he want? Well, but look, he's told us how to overcome temptation. And with every temptation, make a way of escape. And the answer when I thought about it was very, very simple. God sets the world in our hearts, but he wants us to choose him over Amen. the world. Wow. Choose him over the world. Why would God do that? Come out from among them. Be separate. Be that peculiar person that God is walking in and you walking in God. And that's, that is so awesome. And then it goes on to tell us that there to submit ourselves, therefore, to God in James chapter 4 and resist the devil and he will flee from you. And draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. And therefore, your happiness and your security and your peace and, and what really bubbles your heart is when, you, when you're in that relationship with God that's that close. That you can turn away from anything in the world and turn to God. You can choose him every time over the world. You can always choose right over wrong. You can choose kindness over bitterness. You can choose all of these things in you're in God's favor and, and you're in, in fellowship with God. And he smiles upon you. So when you lay down at night and pillow your head, you can say, there's nothing between me and the Savior. You can think about all the good things God's given you and all the good things he's done. And when it comes to that, yes, there's things in the world that will look intriguing, that will look enticing, that will raise your desires. And Satan, like, uh, he, like he did to Eve, oh, that don't look too bad. Are you being robbed of anything? Did God say you can't have all of the fruit? Did God say you couldn't eat of that? How cunning he is. And he appeals to us. And you've got the whole world out there saying, it's all right. Everybody's doing it. There couldn't possibly be anything wrong. Because look at all of these Christians, what they're doing. Well, you might just be being robbed. See, that's the way the devil works. And so we're to draw nigh to God and love him. And accept what God has for us. And while we're close to the end of the book, let's just flip over to uh, the first John chapter two. First John chapter two. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 15. Remember, this is written to whom? My little children. All right? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world... The love of the Father is not in him. Think about that. When your mind and your heart goes off loving the world, the love of God is missing. It, it, it evades away. 
That's, that's Bible. That is Bible. We cannot afford to love the world, neither the things of the world, the trinkets of the world, or the toys of the world, or the ways of the world. And remember our text first. Ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk in these ways. But they said way back then, we will not walk in these ways. And today, as what I'm preaching that we should do, there are multitudes and millions of Christians that say we will not walk in these old ways. But I'm here to tell you tonight, the old ways, the old time way is the good way. It's the right way. And there was a lot less problems back then than there are today. And so it's just, you know, everyone has their choice. But I just, I, I have to agree. I have to agree with this, whoever wrote this little thing right here. I, I have to agree with it, okay? Just a few of these things on here that, that really makes a difference. You know, personally, people can work or they can be at home and cook and, you know, and uh, men can wear the jewelry and women can wear the pants today. That's where we are. Taking over the world. The children could rule the roost. And by the way, they do. They do today. I do not know how many people that we've lost in this church that said we do not have enough stuff for my kids here. Yeah, you may not have heard of it, but, it, but it's happened. And a lot of folks, when they go looking for a church, they don't search out where God wants them to be a blessing and a help. What do you have for my children? What do you have? Where are the people that used to come to church and say, I am looking for a place to serve God? Amen? Amen? Because if you, we don't have a paid parking lot. Do you understand how how it is to come to this church for these years and we don't even have a paved parking lot? Well, you know what? Uh, our spirituality and our ministry for God doesn't make any difference if we have a paved parking lot or if our parking lot's solid gold or if it's gravel we're walking on. It has nothing to do with this. The sacrifice of people driving on gravel and coming in, God ought to be more pleased with you coming in on gravel, worshiping him, than if we had the most beautiful parking lot that was ever created in the church. It's not about the parking lot. It's not about the building. It's about the purity of, of the doctrine and the lives that's worshiping God and coming. God loves you for coming here. God placed us here. This is the right place to be. Not the wrong place. You know, I've watched this congregation struggle to get an air-conditioned system. How long and how many miracles did God have to perform before we got central air conditioned with five air conditioning heating units in this place? And God send us people along that can make these things happen and without God sending people that love the Lord that's willing to make things happen, things are not going to be happen. I want to tell you because we're not a rich church. We're not a huge church. But I tell you every week somehow God puts the finances there. And we don't have a lot extra to look forward to that we can put a cushion on that we don't have to worry. There's not a week goes by that your pastors don't pray for the finances of this church and for the people of this church. And to watch tithers walk off for no reason at all is disgusting to God. But reasons, reasons, not spiritual reasons. Where's the dedication to where God put us? It's important. Yeah, God's going to fill this place. I know it. The Spirit of God is sweet. The love of God is in this congregation. And love draws. Amen. Amen? Love draws. So let's begin to draw them. 
you got all kind of uh, things, okay? The world out there, man, it is a mess. The world is an awful mess out there. And you know what? God's starting to make some headway about changing some things. Have you saw your news lately? People's kind of waking up. They're being shook up a little bit. Amen? And we've got a, we've got a section of our government that's trying to, to push critical race theory and divide us with race, race, race. I'm sick of it. Amen. If there ever was a time in America that it was not a racial country, it's today. I'll prove it to you. All right? How? Well, you know, the only instruction you ever got on anything was in English before Hispanics began to take over. And guess what? Now, you have to have two sets of directions. Amen? Because we've taken their language and their people and we get along good. There's never been a time in the history of our world that there's been so many uh, uh, people of color in the positions they are with the respect of white people. And I'm so sick of them calling me a white supremacist. Let me tell you something. That's what they call me, white supremacist. But you know what? The way why they call me that is they put that title on me. That's not what I say I am. Right. Amen? They want to divide us with race. I don't care what race somebody is. I wish we had some of every race in our church. We need to go out and get some black folks and show how much we love them to stay in this place. Amen? And some Hispanic people. Uh, 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 the Korean people. And by the way, I, uh, where did that go to? Uh, I had something here. I must have got excited and throwed it away. He left it up here. Where did it go? The devil don't want me to show you this. Where is my newspaper? Maybe. Yeah, David left his Bible. Boy, I'm going to get on him when he gets home. This newspaper was given by Mr. Gentry to Aaron about some great deals. A whole newspaper. It's all Chinese. Lots of luck, Aaron. Chinese newspaper. Are, are we racist or are we not? When we can make whole newspapers in Chinese and honor every race from every color, of every color, of every skin, and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ and love them, don't they dare call us racist. They can take that. God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. And they say that we preach from hate, but everything about them is a lie because everything we preach that's hard, that's the truth, is preached with love, not with hate. And it's preached to build and instruct people on what's right and what's wrong. And right now they're trying to cram this, uh, this uh, uh, st stuff down the throats of our children. I was pleased to see that they, that they overturned that, that thing in Virginia. They overturned it. They overturned it. Even one state has put uh, up where it's illegal to have an abortion. Thank God. 
for one state that will stand up. Our nation is pushing hatred and racism and white supremacy. I could tell you a lot of things that's more supreme than white. Amen? It's not the color of anybody's skin. Every person that's breathing is a soul that Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross of Calvary to save, and those are the ones we are to love and search out and win to Jesus Christ. And they're welcome at this church. And people of alternative lifestyles, yeah, they made some bad choices, but they can turn. They can turn if they want to. And God is quite clear about it. You turn or you burn. God doesn't pull no punches. That's not our that's not our fault. It's Christianity. God wrote the book. We just follow. The Lord leads the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. All we have to do is preach his word. We have to love people, and that's what we do here. And we need to reach out with our programs and into our community and fill the house of God. Amen. Search out for some souls. I just thought that it was important because we're, we're, we're always preaching about uh, being separated from the world, and it's not a popular message. But you know, the whole problem, the whole problem of our world is that believers are not separated from it. So if we can just take a fresh look at this, and that can help a few of us, it's going to help this ministry. Amen? Separated from the world unto God. He walks with us. He talks with us. He indwells us. He speaks to us. He loves us. And if we are a friend of the world, we are an enemy of God. Because friendship with the world is enmity with God. Remember, the whole battle that you and I have done when we came into Jesus Christ, we joined his army. I am in the Lord's army. I will fight the battle for him. I will yield myself to him. I will fall away from the world and I will be what God would have me to do. I will be where God wants me to be. I will be what God wants me to be and I will do exactly what God Ask me to do. Amen?